Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. The interview series, Reflections in Time, was begun by the late Professor Paul Borgie more than 20 years ago. This new series continues Paul's work and is dedicated to his memory. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960 and I served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Professor Borgie in the development of his original interview series, and I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to continue this work. It's a uh, bright, beautiful day in November, a week before Thanksgiving, years 2002, and I have as my guest in the studio this afternoon uh, Professor Daniel Sullivan of the UNO Chemistry Department. Dan, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Jack. Nice to see you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about old times. Uh, you've been here almost as long as I have, so uh, we'll have a lot to talk about, I'm sure. You're currently a professor in the Department of Chemistry, right? That's right. It's an honor to be here. I am a professor of chemistry and have been, as you know, for a while. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about you, uh, as um, you know, as relates to uh, how you got started in all of this. Uh, first of all, I think you were born and grew up uh, in Iowa, right? That's right. I was graduated from Corning Iowa High School in 1954, and went down to Missouri to Northwest Missouri Teachers College mm -hmm. at Maryville at that time. How did you pick that place? It was cheap, and I had a high school guidance counselor who said that he thought I'd be a pretty good shop and science teacher. The yeah. tuition was $40 a semester and they loaned you the books. Wow. It was worth it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm very grateful to the people of the state of Missouri. Well, um, it seems that uh, high school guidance counselors have a lot to do with, uh, with how we end up in many, in many uh, occasions. I've, that's been my experience anyhow in talking with people. Um, so you went to um, you went to high school then in Iowa. You went to uh, uh, you went to college uh, in at uh, Northwest Missouri, as you mentioned. And um, then what did you do? You were trained to be a high school teacher. Did you go and teach high school? That's right. I was graduated in 1958 and lucky to get a job teaching back in Iowa, which had high educational standards and a salary of four thousand dollars a year. So I taught industrial arts and mechanical drawing and biology and physics at Prescott, Iowa for two years and then went to Anita, Iowa where I added chemistry. And I was lucky to get to teach chemistry because nobody takes chemistry unless they have to. So I had excellent students at Anita. And I had had one course in chemistry and since I had a minor in general science and a minor in math and in physics, I was obviously eligible to teach. Now for the... Um geographically challenged of us, uh, uh, where, are, uh, where is Prescott, Iowa? Prescott and Anita are both almost straight east of here. Anita is on I-80 going across oh. Iowa a little farther north. Okay, about how? F about 100 miles about east. About 100 miles mm -hmm. east of here. Okay. So that wasn't a, a far uh, distance from, uh, from there to Omaha? No. Although there were no, the interstate wasn't complete back then. That's, <laughs> that's true. The interstate was not complete and it was kind of tricky if you were driving in at night to take night classes. Right. All the same, it was handy. Yeah. So what route did you take driving in? Route 6? Took highway, highway 6. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. I've driven that many times back, uh, yes. back long ago. Um, uh, how did you happen to end up uh, here at the University, what well, was the University of Omaha, Municipal University of Omaha back then, I guess, wasn't it? That's right. In 1961, I 
was able to take a National Science Foundation in-service fellowship and came out with a number of other high school teachers to take modern develops in developments in chemistry mm -hmm. with Don Marquardt. And it almost killed all of us, but I learned a lot of chemistry and realized there was a lot of chemistry I didn't have. Now, Don, Don Marquardt was the uh, was chairman a, of the department back then, That's right. Then, he was chair of the department at that time. The following spring, I took modern developments in physics with, with uh, John McMillan, and Don Marquardt offered me a position to come out and teach laboratories here as an assistant instructor. And just for uh, the record, John McMillan was chairman of the physics department back I then. I believe he was the only member in the physics he department at that was. time. Yeah. Well, I can remember back in those days, uh, um, in the early 60s, uh, scientists were kind of hard to recruit. Um, that was in the post-Sputnik years when we were gearing up uh, for, uh, uh, well, I guess, to, uh, to match the Soviet Union in some of their scientific feats. And uh, there was a big demand for people with doctoral degrees in, uh, in chemistry and physics and some of these other fields. So uh, uh, smaller institutions, as uh, Omaha University was back then, had a hard time uh, attracting faculty members in these disciplines. Great time to be a science teacher or a student. Yeah, it sure Lots was. of money for, for grants, lots of money for scholarship programs. And many institutions benefited from that money and helped to expand right. their science departments. Right. So um, you started in graduate work here then? I came out here and took organic chemistry. The first uh, semester I was here, I took organic chemistry. We taught it at night and during the day, and I got the high grade in the day class. A friend got the high grade in the night class, and we both got B's. <laughs> Organic chemistry hasn't changed. <laughs> well, um, you ended up um, uh, in the field of biochemistry, which is uh, not too far removed. That's, that's true. I was lucky to fall in, follow in the footsteps of Paul Stageman. And I got a degree, a Master of Arts in General Science from the old Omaha University, and then went to the Medical Center for a PhD in Biochemistry. Now, you mentioned Paul. Uh, Paul Stageman was, uh, again, one of the professors here back then. Yes, Paul. There were four members of the department, Don Marquardt, and Walt Lindstromberg, Paul Stageman, and Bob Keppel, and all of those people had a profound effect on me. And Bob had only come here a couple years before that, Bob Keppel, because That's right. uh, he... Uh, joined the faculty the same year I did. We were oh, both part of the newcomers group in 1960. Ah, I see. Yeah. Great man. Yes, I, uh, I enjoyed him very much. He was a, he was a good guy. Uh, been deceased for a number of years now. Yes, unfortunately. We, we miss him. He was one of the few people who wasn't ashamed to pick up a guitar and walk into class and sing a chemical song to the class. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, folk songs were uh, his avocation. That's right. Um, so you, uh, you finally ended up with your master's degree a, a couple years later, didn't you? Master's degree in 1966, and then went on to UNMC with a PhD there in 1972. But we didn't have a, um, we didn't have a master's degree in chemistry or physics back then. No, either. back then we did have a master's degree in general science, yeah. and several people did go through with that degree. And that's what you, uh, that's, and that's what, what you I got. got. Good. And then, the, as you say, you went to the, uh, I guess it would have been the College of Medicine back then, wouldn't it? It was, yes, the, the Medical Center campus, um, the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and that was associated with several programs at Lincoln, so my degree is actually through Lincoln. Right. Well, uh, of course, that's still true, that all, uh, gradu all doctoral degrees in the university that's true. are... They're through Lincoln, maybe, but they're University of Nebraska degrees undesignated, That's if right. I remember correctly. Yeah. I presume it's still that way. It's been I four or five so. years since I had anything directly <laughs> to do kind with it. kind of lucky when I actually got my Ph.D. It was granted on the same day as an honorary degree was given to John Nyhart, a Nebraska's yeah. poet laureate. And he was a really short guy with an immense shock of white hair. And when they announced his degree, he stood up on the stage and gave a V for victory sign <laughs> a la Nixon. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good story. Um, so um, your doctoral degree, your PhD, then was in biochemistry. In biochemistry. Um, and uh, what uh, what sort of things did you spend? What was your uh, what was your dissertation topic? Well, I was particularly interested in mental retardation caused mm -hmm. by phenylketonuria, 
a deficiency of metabolism of phenylalanine. Mm -hmm. So I isolated a couple of the enzymes were involved in phenylketonuria, was able to show that the enzyme activity varied through a cycle around the oh. clock, and that was my big contribution to metal retardation. Well, that's a certainly an interesting and uh, an important topic, actually. Um, so, where do we go from here now? You're uh, you're at UNO. Let uh, let's take just a minute, though, uh, while I think of it, to uh, uh, reminisce just a little bit about what the physical facilities for the chemistry department were like back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Well, then as 60s. then as now. The chemistry department was located on the top floor of the building, and parking on campus was very difficult. Now, I've heard the story that you always put it on the top floor in case something explodes. There's nothing up above to be damaged. That's true. <laughs> there are no, no people above that you have to get out, so that's the big thing. And it's been a good thing. You know, every chemistry department catches fire sooner or later. <laughs> and there's a minor explosion sooner or later, so that's why we always wear safety glasses, and that's why the chemistry department's on the top floor. So what was it like on the top floor of what's now Arts and Sciences Hall? It was an environmental hazard, actually, and our chemistry stores were very poorly ventilated. We, it's a wonder we didn't have more difficulty than we did, but it was a great atmosphere. You know, this, this was the making of me to come here to Omaha U. These people had a lot of good ideas. They would sit and talk with you about them, and you could walk around the campus and talk to people such as Wilfred Payne, Talk mm -hmm. to people such as Derbyshire and biology, and these Wilfred guys were Payne strong. was uh, head of the uh, 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 philosophy department. Philosophy at uh, that time. I've always regretted that we didn't uh, get a tape of him for this series, uh, mm -hmm. but he had moved to California, I think, before we started doing it. Yeah. The kind of guy that people would go and have lunch with just to hear him talk. Oh, he was a delight. I enjoyed yes. uh, many conversations with him. Yes. Um, did I ask you earlier? how your interest in chemistry developed? I well, can't recall whether I did or not. I, I suppose I might preface this by saying that I don't have to ever worry about dying of a heart attack or in a car accident because my dad told me I was going to blow myself up someday. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up on a farm. My parents yeah. were nearly 50 when I was born. I had a lot of time to myself and I mixed everything I could possibly mix on that farm and it was in a small town where one could wander through the pharmacy or the veterinarian's office or the, the hardware store and the blacksmith shop and ask questions and see remarkable things in action. Hmm. Well, uh, I guess if uh, my memory's correct, uh, uh, various uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers and so on are the basis for a good many uh, explosions these days, That's unfortunately. True. Too bad. Actually, some of my classmates were missing fingers from various explosions. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, do you uh, want to, uh, you've uh, reminisced just a little bit about your uh, experience as a high school teacher before you came here. Is there, before we leave that, is there anything else you want to well, I, I would remember just, about uh, it? Well, I would just say that I had some excellent students in high school. It was a lot of fun. And that when you sign up to be a high school teacher, you do lots of things other than teach the particular mm -hmm. course. And since I was interested in photography, I started a photography club. Ah. A number of students learned the basics of darkroom work at that time. One went on to become a commercial photographer and was killed in Vietnam, I'm sad mm -hmm. to say, Doug Holland. You, uh, you soon came here, though, as we've talked about. What um, and we mentioned a little about what the physical facilities were like. Mm -hmm. um, what did you do? What were your, uh, what, what sort of assignments did you have as a beginning uh, chemistry teacher here while you were working on your master's degree? I, I was really lucky to be able to run a demonstration and problem solving program. And since we were really tight in the laboratories, we were very limited in laboratory space, I would have about 60 students in room 437, as you recall, in mm -hmm. the old what's now Arts, Arts and Science Hall, was the administration building right. then. And I would do an hour of a chemistry experiment for them. I'd set it up ahead of time, make sure that everything would work, make sure that it got the right results. They would take down the data, and the next week they would come back with their experiment filled out and explain it to me. And then I'd spend an hour working problems with them, tutoring mm -hmm. them. That was a really excellent thing, I thought. 
Uh, actually, um, I guess that uh, you didn't spend too many years up there on the uh, fourth floor of uh, of the administration building, or uh, as it's called now, Arts and Sciences mm -hmm. Hall, because a new building was under construction in 1968. That's true. We moved to Allwine Hall in 1971 formally. It mm -hmm. took a long time to box everything up and get over there, but enjoyed Allwine Hall for a number of years. And that's, uh, that was the new building on campus back, uh, back then. Yes, since that time there have been a number. There have been the, the Fine Arts Building, mm -hmm. the Performing Arts Center, Durham Science Center, of course, Kaiser Hall, and the Roskins Building. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I remember, all Wine Hall, which housed biology and chemistry, was the last building that was built with funds from the old Municipal University of Omaha. I think that's right. Yeah. And I remember it very well because all summer long, when I was trying to teach summer school classes, they had pile drivers driving oh, yes. uh, steel into the. Yes. <laughs> you remember that? That's right. You could feel those all over the campus. Uh, I don't know why, but they had to drive the steel down to the bedrock, I guess, and uh, it I th uh, took a while. I think they built that building with a foundation in mind so that if they needed to, they could go up from mm -hmm. there. It's, uh, well, it, uh, we were all envious of you back in those days, <laughs> I remember, because you guys got to move into a new building. Well, not only a new building, but a new building which had glass pipes across the ceiling. So if anybody dumped some blood down the drain up above, it went all the way down <laughs> to the bottom. I remember those, too. But it was very distracting. In the, well, I guess the third floor of that building, there were five floors, right? That's right. And the third floor had classrooms. Mm -hmm. And the, these glass pipes designed, I guess, to keep chemicals from uh, uh, eating away the pipes, That's right. uh, these glass pipes would run through the classrooms, and every now and then you'd see something colorful going through these pipes. That's true, and every once in a while one would leak. I recall Dr. Lindsterberg was running an organic chemistry lab one day, and a student or a faculty member from the biology department came running upstairs and said, "A pipe's leaking. It's dripping in my <laughs> office." And Dr. Lindsterberg rather nonchalantly said, "Well, we'll be done in about an hour and a half." <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, but the uh, the Allwine Hall facility was uh, a nice facility. It's a great building. Yeah, it was a, very a, fine building. A big step up from uh, from where you had been in the. At least you, everybody had a private office there. Back in yes. the old days, you kind of had a, a bullpen in the, for some of the faculty. That's right. You? There were quite a number of us in one office in in Arts and Science Hall. And in fact, if you go back and look at the laboratories that we had there. They looked very much like the photos of the labs in the 20s. Mm -hmm. Tons of bottles, hundreds of bottles sitting on top of the benches. Interesting. Um, yeah, well, I was uh, originally back in, uh, I guess it must have been the late 40s, early 50s, uh, a, a chemistry major oh. and uh, in, uh, undergraduate in college. Mm -hmm. And I can remember our, uh, this was, of course, back on the East Coast, mm -hmm. not here in uh, Nebraska, but uh, but I can remember our chemistry laboratories looked like that, too. So Yes, and you know, we would probably never use many of the chemicals now that we use then. Too dangerous? They are dangerous and in some cases carcinogenic. Yes. Hmm. Well, I guess uh, we survived, so... Uh, we live. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can remember uh, somebody pouring uh, in the in the winter time, uh, disposing of uh, some ethyl ether by uh, pouring it out the window onto a snowbank. Oh yes, <laughs> evaporated. People would do that kind of thing, and I and I recall Bob Keppel testing out an apparatus one day, and it sprayed concentrated sulfuric acid on his clothes, so he lost his pants <laughs> and wore a lab coat the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> With no <laughs> sounds, pants. Sounds like Bob. Um, he was a character. Um, was it a big job to move to all uh, to, to move to all Wine Hall? You mentioned that it took a while. Lots of work. Uh, there there was a, an immense amount of packing and cataloging to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. George Greer was our storeroom attendant at the time, and much of that work fell on him. But he was yeah. a great man and really yeah, did a good job man. of it. Um, you. Um, uh, you didn't, uh, well, I was going to say you didn't stay in all wine long, but you did for quite a while. Uh, 
And then you had another new another move to another new building. You mentioned a That's few right. moments ago the Durham Science Center, which uh, was a superb facility. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. It still is a superb facility. The um, uh, that was a uh, effort moving there too. I'm sure it was a big move there. We had some equipment we actually had to bring in cranes for to come out the mm -hmm. window on the side of the building to get the large spectrophotometers out. And by then we had accumulated enough large laboratory equipment that it was more of a problem to move. I think we moved to Durham in '87, in mm -hmm. May of '87, and of course it's a show place. It's a great building. Now, did you uh, you were here during all of the planning for that building, did you get involved in the uh, in the planning and design of that building? I know the architects mm -hmm. were very good about consulting faculty in the building they, of that. They were good. They, they did a good job of talking to us about most things other than air handling. And so we had a chance to put in our two cents and, and actually design the personal space that we needed for our own laboratories. Mm -hmm. When we moved to Allwine Hall, I was spending a lot of time still in graduate school, so I was not as heavily involved in the planning for Allwine, nor in the packing, but mm -hmm. got to do some of the carrying around. Well, the Allwine Hall, aside from being the last uh, building built with uh, University of Omaha funds, was also the last building, I think, designed by the Latenzer firm, which uh, had done the uh, the other. I think that's right. Uh, uh, the arch that's which right. Were, they were the architects mm -hmm. for the other buildings on the. Yes, I think we switched to HDR, didn't we? After that. Well, after yeah, yeah I mean, once we became a state university, there was uh, um, all the state rules that you had to oh, follow yes. about uh, opening up these mm -hmm. contracts for that's right. the lowest bidder and uh, this kind. That's right. Well, not necessarily the lowest bidder, but I remember very. Uh, I remember a good many sessions where we heard architects make presentations about mm -hmm. what they could do and what their buildings would be like. Oh, that's true. And we're better for it, I think. Yeah. And we undoubtedly are, because we got a fine, fine building. With yes. Them. And uh, Mr. Durham and his wife were generous enough to donate that lovely atrium to us. Yes. And that's, that's a really nice feature of the building that makes it very pleasant to work there. Yeah. That was, uh, that's good design. Um, the um, and as you mentioned, by that time you the department had uh, had an assortment of uh, of electronic equipment, equipment mm -hmm. of various sorts that uh, took some effort to move. Uh, that kind of indicates that, as we were talking before, the the uh, uh, laboratories were like the laboratories of the twenties with the bottles on the benches and so That's on. Right. Uh, but uh, chemistry was changing. That's, that's true. We used to spend a lot of time writing e equations, balancing equations, memorizing things, and we spent much more time memorizing those days because mm -hmm. in a lot of cases we simply didn't understand what was going on. Once you understand what's going on, then you can spend time thinking about why does this happen? How does this fit in with the scheme of things? So we don't do quite as much wet chemistry now. We do quite a lot more instrumentation. And Tell course, us what you mean by wet chemistry. Well, them. we don't have as many test tubes and beakers. We still right. do a fair amount of that. But before, we did practically everything in test tubes and beakers. And now we do a great deal on the computer. Lots of molecular design on the computers. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of calculations on the computer. I recall the first calculator that showed up on campus. It was about half the size of a football. cost about $500 and didn't really do as much as the ones they give you in the grocery yeah. store now. <laughs> Uh, I, it's, uh, sometimes it seems to me, though, that uh, that the uh, test tubes and the beakers were kind of the fun of chemistry back when I was taking it. <laughs> well, a lot of what we've done is to assume that the high school teachers will teach those mm -hmm. that wet chemistry, and it's unfortunate because sometimes students show up and they don't know much descriptive chemistry and may not have an idea about the physical characteristics of compounds or elements. Mm -hmm. Are you still teaching pretty much the same courses that you've been teaching? I've been teaching the same pattern pretty much for five or ten years now. I teach biochemistry, a junior-senior level biochem class for students headed for med school or biology majors, and also physician assistant students. I teach an environmental chemistry class, which is a survey class for non-science majors and also the first class in our environmental science program. Mm -hmm. And then I also teach a biomedical metabolism class for students headed for med school. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, have you continued at all with the uh, 
the research that you did on your dissertation, that you were talking about the research on the enzymes involved in phenylketonuria. I haven't, uh, I stayed current with that research, yeah. but I haven't done research in that area, in part because it's rather difficult to work with animals now, yeah. and in part because there are a lot of other things that interest me. So I have done research on some strange gases, and every now and then go to the laboratory and spend some time trying to figure out something that, that just really puzzles me. Have you kept up your association with the people at the, in the, at the medical uh, college? I have, but you know, most of those people have retired. That's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> we all get old, don't we? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are your research interests uh, generally now? If you uh, Well, I'm really involved now in outreach and finding ways of explaining chemistry to non-chemists or, or explaining getting students, getting grade school and elementary students interested in chemistry. So I spend a lot of time now designing pedagogical activities, how, how to make something attractive, how to show a chemical principle in a way that hasn't been done before. Yeah, I, re, uh, I recall that. that. That goes back a ways, too. You, uh, that's not, uh, not something brand new. No, it's not new. It's, and, it's uh, gone from what I understand, time. you do a spectacular job of it. And uh, I don't use the word spectacular <laughs> lightly, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> well, people do hear from us from time to time. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, there's something called, what is it called? Kapow. Kapow, Chemistry and Physics on Wheels. Chemistry and Physics on Wheels. Yes. Uh, can you uh, briefly tell us something sure. about that? Sure. You know, when I first started here at the university, from time to time, the public would be interested in activities, and, and we'd have little programs for children on Saturday morning. And I began then going around town with buckets of chemicals and boxes of various things. And finally, Bob Graham in the physics department said, well, that's a really interesting program. Let's buy a van and start a van program. And that's been very successful. We see probably 40,000 children a year maybe do a hundred or so programs a year and we've been much over quite a lot of the United States, Texas and Canada, and wow. New York, Washington and Oregon. And so you've uh, developed a uh, um, developed a method of, uh, of showing students, uh, not only showing them what it's all about, but uh, uh, but showing them in such a way that you stimulate their interest. And, uh, I, I think there are a lot yeah. of little kids who will never forget these programs. I have to, have to tell you, when I was a child in in, high, in grade school at Corning, Iowa, some faculty member from Ames came down to Corning and did one of these science programs, and honestly, that's probably the thing that hooked me on science. Hmm. Great. He didn't have the kind of things available that I have. Well, to I think maybe we could take a brief look at uh, some of those things that you have available, and uh, maybe... Uh, Maybe get some idea as to uh, as to why this, how this works, and why it's become so popular. I think they uh, they might even have a, a clip here in the, in the television studio of uh, some of those activities that they could uh, show to us Great. if uh, they're ready to do. It will make a lot of noise and some smoke. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> so look here on his back. See all this ice? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Dry ice. And we should give him a hand. Because he's a... Yay. All right. Wow. <laughs> so here on his back is ice. And this is dry ice or solid carbon dioxide. Solid carbon dioxide. And we say it's dry ice because it doesn't melt. It just goes from a solid directly off into the air. That cooled you down a little, didn't yes, it? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Can I have another shot? <laughs> <laughs> yes. As a matter of fact... I think they should too. So let's just empty the rest of the tank, and we're not going to shoot it right on anybody. I'm just going to shoot it up in the air. It'll, again, it'll make a lot of smoke. Now, let's check the tank out. Do you feel the tank, Tramoon? What do you think? Hot or cold? Check it out. Hot or cold? Oh, I lost my oh, hat. Did you set it on my head? No. <laughs> what do you think? How about that shirt? Uh, no. Oh, no. Shirt. Oh, shirt. 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 Did you like to feel this? Oh, never mind. 
You want to tell us a little bit about what's going on there? Well, first we should warn people not to try that at home, I suppose. <laughs> but that's the thing that makes science fun. You know, science changes every day. It's a lot of fun. Children in particular, but adults are fascinated by the things we do. And of course, this was a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. And we were simply letting it come out with very high pressure. Gives us a chance to talk about science and about history a little bit and, and about our universe. And the neat thing about this is, imagine I'm 66 years old and little kids or people who are 20 years old think I have something worth listening to <laughs> or watching. <laughs> well, they certainly were enjoying it. That was very clear. Um, wish we had, uh, had one of those clips of you uh, exploding a hydrogen balloon, though. I think that was... <laughs> I wish I'd brought one. <laughs> We could have uh, shaken up the people in the studio a little. It always does. <laughs> right. And whenever I ask the educators in the buildings, they always want us to do it. <laughs> that way the rest of the teachers will know that they're doing something. <laughs> well, it's a lot of fun and, uh, and a great educational experience for these, uh, for these kids that you're working with. It's a tremendous amount of fun for me and for the science demonstrators who go along on the Kapow van. Now, how many of those vans do you have now? Well, we have three vans now. OPPD leased us a van a year ago, and that's an energy van. Mm -hmm. Then we have a very large van that's usually full of physics equipment, and the smaller van, which is generally chemistry and some physics. Now, I've seen one of those parked over by the, um, the new um, IS and, uh, Information Science and Technology yes. building. We often park one over there and one in the west parking lot and yeah. one in the parking garage. Well, that's a that's a great project. I'm uh, uh, something you can really be proud of. I think oh. you and uh, it's a lot of fun. You and, and Bob Graham too. I that's mean, right. I, I think uh, I and the and the physics instructors who've done this and Dana Richter Egger, one of our newer instructors, now are involved, actually have been able to have a lot of fun and certainly spread the the gospel of science yeah. or provide interest in science. Well, it's a uh, as I say, it's something you can be you can be especially proud of. I'm. Uh, I think it uh, reflects well on the uh, University of Nebraska at Omaha to have folks mm -hmm. like you who are concerned not just with uh, not just with college students, although we're concerned with obviously with those too. Uh, that's our primary concern, but to be concerned with uh, stimulating the interest in the kids before they get to college, the, 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 because as you say, those, the younger generation is uh, is what's going to be our future. Well, you know, those little kids will become all kinds of amazing things. And, and I have seldom seen anybody who really wanted to be a scientist mm -hmm. or wanted to go to medical school who wasn't smart enough to do it. What happens, though, is they get led astray or nobody ever says to them, hey, you could do this. So it's important for them to see it early. And, of course, your uh, teaching activities here on campus have... Uh, uh, have not gone unrewarded either. You uh, you did get uh, the excellent in excellence in teaching award, uh, if I remember, uh, mm -hmm. not too I, many years ago. I was honored. Yeah, yes, that's nice. That's great. Um, in fact, you uh, you also got the alumni outstanding teaching award from the College of Arts and Sciences. They were uh, nice enough to give me that. And uh, the Carnegie Foundation for the or I should say Carnegie. I got to say that correctly, right? Am I? Friends have told me that uh, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching uh, gave you an award, too, as Professor of the Year. One year. Well, that, that was nice, but you know, that didn't just come to me. That's a reflection on the institution, yeah. too. Great. Um, the, um, uh, let's see, what haven't we talked about that we, uh, that we need to be sure and cover here? Um, Notice that you are looking at your resume, that you have a so membership in a number of professional organizations mm -hmm. that you've been active in, um, that you have, um, uh, that you've been uh, active in pre-medical education. You mentioned that just a moment ago. Um, have you you've been an advisor for pre-med students on the campus? Yes, I have, have for quite a while. You know, I took my Ph.D. on the Medical Center campus, right. so I took lots of med school classes and kind of knew a little bit about where the bodies were buried, in some cases literally, by the way, down there. <laughs> so, so when I came back here, naturally it was 
appropriate for me to talk to students who plan to go to medical school. And we still have a, a thriving population of people who will become professionals in many different medical areas. I guess chemistry is a popular major for pre-med students, isn't it? Chemistry or biology or psychology, but honestly, the medical school is happy to see an English or a music major come in. So long as they have enough chemistry courses to go along That's right. They, they really like the kind of odd majors, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gee, I also noticed looking at, the, uh, at your list of accomplishments here that you're a member of a of the same club uh, club that I am. You uh, received the Chancellor's Medal medal uh, a while back. That was very nice of her. Yeah. <laughs> and congratulations for receiving it. <laughs> well, there are a good many of us now. That's been quite going on for quite a while. Um, and in addition to all of this, well, you, you mentioned a few moments ago when we were talking about uh, your high school teaching activities that you were interested in photography. Uh, have you kept up that interest? And, uh, well, I've taken a lot of photography classes actually at Metro. Metro has uh -huh. wonderful photography classes and teachers, and I was very lucky to have some good teachers there. And, and so it's an avocation of mine. So that's, that's Metro Community Metro, College Metro here Metropolitan Omaha, Community right? College, yes, the Elkhorn campus. And I've taken lots of classes there, learned a lot, still working on it, still trying to learn more. So what kind of things do you do? What, what your, what, uh, what kind of photography attracts you most? I shoot almost everything that interests me and anything that moves or stands still. And I look for odd things. For example, if you go around the country periodically, you see a really strange sign. And so I have shot lots of those. And you know, if you accumulate enough photos, sooner or later you have enough for a show. So some time back, my wife helped me put together a, a show called Signs of Our Times that mm. toured around Omaha for a little while. Yeah, I, I I remember that. Uh, or at least I don't remember the details of it, but I remember reading about it. Yes. And, uh, I, I did. I'm sorry I didn't get to see it. And you also have a, if I remember, uh, another avocational interest in poetry. Well, I think people write poetry when they're emo emotionally disturbed, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so from time to time, when I had something on my mind, I did write poetry and, and have written quite a little and published a little bit, but I certainly can't claim to be a poet of any quality. <laughs> um, well, just having published it is a, is a sign of something uh, oh. that uh, not very many of us can uh, lay claim to. It's, it's nice, but when you have guys around such as Pat Gray and Mike Scow, Frank Steno, they're really somebody to look for to look up to. You know, we've talked a little bit about um, about some interesting changes in the university, um, particularly as it was reflected in the new buildings that you've moved into. Um, when you first came here, it was a municipal University of Omaha. That's true. Did you, uh, what kind, other than the buildings, what sorts of changes did you notice when we became part of the state university system? Did you notice anything gro greatly different? Well, of course, we expanded our faculty from five members of the chemistry department to 10 members, 10 professors, and four instructors or assistant instructors mm -hmm. now. The student body changed somewhat. I, I honestly think that the students now are very similar to what they might have been 20, 30, 40 years ago, mm -hmm. they're still working way too much. They still have a hard time balancing everything. You mean working outside working of the outside, classroom? Working outside, sure. They, yeah. they, they work many hours outside the classroom. And that's been a characteristic of Omaha University and the University of Nebraska at Omaha. The administration has changed. It's become much more collegiate. Uh, Milo Bale ran a pretty tight ship. Well, he... He had to, I guess, because he didn't have much money to run it with. <laughs> that, that, and he had come from a time, you recall, when back in the 30s there were some concerns about the university. Uh, certainly, people thought that the the campus was far too liberal, that the instructors were far too liberal. So, Dr. Bale tightened things up. He was an excellent administrator in that he gave us a public face, and he dealt with the people in the city and the state very well. After he left came Leland Trawick, who actually gave us keys to the building so we could get in at night and on the weekends, <laughs> and was just such a nice guy. People really opened up under him, and I, I think that we blossomed, and with the more recent presidents, we, we've done very well. Well, maybe I shouldn't mention this, but um, 
I had a key to the building, to administration building, uh, when Milo Bale was president. Well, you were one of those who trusted him. <laughs> no, he didn't know about it. Oh, I see. <laughs> Actually, there were, there were probably people he didn't like who probably didn't get the salary raises they might have known. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to know this about Milo Bale. He was the kind of guy who knew everything that went on. He hired personally every janitor, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he knew that janitor's name and could call your name going across campus and knew what you were up to. Mm -hmm. Took a very close interest in these, both the students and the, the staff. I wanted to do some research work that involved um, using animals, rats. And um, mm -hmm. Dr. Bale had had some bad experiences with faculty members who had had animals mm -hmm. in the laboratories. So he didn't, didn't like people to have their lunches in their office. Right. He, didn't, any, he didn't like animals. that, but uh, I worked very well with the um, head of buildings and grounds, and uh, he, he found a spot for me where I could put those animals in, I see. in an old coal bin down oh, in, that's, uh, that's lucky. Uh, yes, in, the, in the administration building. And uh, he found a side door that gave me access to that oh, coal bin okay. so I could come in on the uh, weekends and feed the animals. Oh, you're a lucky so man. So that's how I got a key. That, that's I thought rare. maybe I'd better explain that. I haven't <laughs> mentioned it. Well, I was wondering about that. <laughs> but it was, um, it was fun back then. And, yeah, uh, so there was really exciting times and difficult times because we were changing from that atmosphere in which it was a very autocratic rule to a more collegiate activity. Mm -hmm. And Carl Jonas once published a book called The Sputnik Rapist. And in that, if you read about the activities of the faculty and the, the administration, it was then very much as that book suggested. Carl Jonas was a well-known author yes. who uh, taught English courses here part-time, right. yes. That's right. If you went to the first faculty meeting in the fall, held in the old auditorium, as you came out, Dr. Bale's secretary was there to give you your parking sticker. That was a way of getting people to attend the meetings. That's if right. If you didn't attend the meetings, you had to go to his office and to you pick may... up your parking sticker and explain why you hadn't That's been right. the meeting. That's right. And were you at that famous faculty meeting where Al Hill moved that the arts and science faculty go on record as being opposed to taking attendance at faculty meetings? <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> Which caused a lot of <laughs> consternation. And, and up until that time, the attendance at all those faculty meetings went to Dr. Bale. Mm -hmm. And he checked it out personally. Well, there were times when I was dean where I wished we still had that rule <laughs> because we had trouble getting a quorum I'm on sure. several occasions. I'm sure of that. <laughs> but um, I'm sure it was, uh, was for the best. I, I think so. Do Dr. Bale really did a great deal for the university. You, you have to put him down as a, a great man, although you might have chafed a little under some of his restrictions at the time. Well, he was, uh, he had some of your background. He was a high school science That's teacher. That's right. He, he taught was a physics. chemist. Had taught, had taught physics and chemistry. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's a good well, preparation for life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always, uh, I always recommend to students, or did when I was in contact with students, that, uh, that science majors are good for them, and um, they uh, are good for lots of things in later life. Absolutely. And uh, help them become better informed citizens. Like Absolutely. Well, you know, you have, as a, as a science major, you take philosophy classes and classes in sociology, and, and much of the time a science major has some difficulty understanding those. For example, I, I was really disturbed once when a college professor said that it was not his job to make me feel comfortable. It was his job to make college sophomores hate their fathers. <laughs> <laughs> it took some doing for me to get around that one. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, yeah, that. So, so I, I really do think that um, that we need to encourage more students into into um, into science majors and science and mathematics. I no. uh, I've always yeah shouldn't get off on a personal uh, uh, opinion here, but I've always felt that uh, that mathematics is probably the most useful major for any. Uh, for any student because with a good background in mathematics you can go into any of the sciences and be ahead of the game. If you don't have some math it's really difficult yeah. for you to understand anything. You know recently I read an, in the Chemical and Engineering News a publication an account of a restaurant in Phoenix and this particular restaurant served wonderful quiches, four egg quiches and a representative of the health department came by and said that she'd like them to take one of those eggs out of the quiche because she had found out that one out of four eggs had salmonella in it. 
<laughs> and the restaurant owner said, well, is it okay if we just take three eggs out of the dozen and then we can make quiches with the remaining? <laughs> she said she'd have to think about that. Oh, very good. Um, did you, um, let, well, we started in here now talking about uh, Dr. Bale, Milo Bale. Um, it might be interesting to uh, spend some of the time that we have left reminiscing about other people that you uh, you mentioned Leland Trawick, Dr. Trawick, who was, uh, who succeeded Dr. Uh, succeeded Dr. He succeeded Dr. Bale immediately. Yes, he came he? after Dr. Bale, and at one of the earliest faculty meetings he held, he ended the faculty meeting uh, by quoting Frost stopping by a woodyard on mm -hmm. a snowy evening. Do you recall that? Mm -hmm. And the faculty loved that. Yeah. They thought they were in the presence of a scholar. Well, he did another good thing for us, too. He was the one that brought computers to campus. That's right. Um, we had some uh, tabulating machines and so mm -hmm. on in, uh, uh, for keeping registration records and, so, but, and accounting records. Mm -hmm. But we had uh, very little, uh, if anything, uh, along those lines for the academic departments. We couldn't begin to get along without them now. And uh, we hired Dr. Walden, Bill Walden, mm -hmm. back in the early 60s, and he had an IBM 1620 that he yes. ca came with. Remember that computer? I remember a couple of those computers, the IBM 1620, and then the chemistry department had one that was similar to that, which locked up yeah. and never worked again. And, uh, well... <laughs> sat there for a long time. <laughs> yeah, that, was a, that was the beginning of computing on this campus, and uh, we were... Some of us uh, deeply involved in it. And, oh yes, and it's grown now to yes. where we have a, a what well, we mentioned a minute ago, the uh, ISNT, Information Science and Technology mm -hmm. Building. So we have a whole building that's uh, that's dedicated to that. That's now. right, and one of the ways that teaching and, and chemistry have changed is that it's so easy now to go on the web and look up either a historic or a scientific fact, and all these crazy little things that people used to want to know about, they can they can dig up very rapidly. Well, does hot water boil faster than cold water, for example, and all kinds of things that people have really researched and have really looked into. And you can also put the lie to a lot of myths. You can find things that really aren't true. And um, just in the most mundane things, you can, um, you using uh, computers to, uh, to run chemistry experiments these days. That's right. And has, that's been true for some time now. As a matter of fact, a lot of schools cut costs in this way. They actually do away with their laboratories and have students run the experiments on the computer. S simulate them on the computer. Mm -hmm. But which I was thinking of actually the computers running the wet chemistry. Well, the computers are really good at accumulating data yeah. for us. And you can ask the computer to do something. Or, for that matter, in the shop, in, in the building facilities, you can program a computer to to tell it to cut a, a piece of metal of a particular size yeah. with a hole at a certain angle, and it will do a lovely job of it. Well, I got uh, I got off the track for a minute there. I started to, uh, talking about uh, Dr. Bale and Dr. Mm -hmm. Trawick, um, and uh, let's see who succeeded Dr. Trawick. It was Kurt, Kurt Naylor, Naylor, I think, yes. Dr. Naylor, mm -hmm. who. Uh, um, so we you've, we've seen lots of. Um, Yes, lots of administration here, lots of administrators who ran the university, uh, all of whom had very great mm -hmm. strengths, I think, in some that, way or another. Some that's true. Some that's very true. different from others, but uh, I, I think if you think of Del Weber, here here's a fellow who really helped the university, really was a, as great a proponent of the university to the public as Milo Bale mm -hmm. was and then went on after he left the university and still continues to, to help us to some extent, to look after us and, and give us good advice and, and be a good spokesperson for the university. We've been very lucky, I think, in, uh, in having right. uh, good people at the helm. Um, let's reminisce a little more about some of the other people, not necessarily the people at the top, but uh, you've mentioned a, a number of uh, people who I remember very well in the chemistry department and in the physics department. Uh, uh, faculty people, mm -hmm. um, and you've mentioned pa faculty people from other departments. So uh, Wilfred true. Payne, for example. Yes, Wilfred Payne was uh, was a very interesting individual. Of course, the biology department had Carl Bush and Merle Brooks. Tell something about them. Well, Merle, Dr. Bush was uh, chairman of biology when I came. Dr. Here. Bush was chair of biology and a uh, very interesting person. Merle Brooks had a lot of personality. And, and if I remember, he came here because he could 
bring a National Science That's Foundation right. grant with him when, as he came for training teachers. He brought the National Science Foundation grant, and indirectly, that's what brought me. Mm -hmm. Merle was a botanist, had a tremendous store of information, and simply loved to tell stories. He told a story once about being caught on a mountain without any food, but with a pound of butter, and coming down the mountain and finding a big puffball mushroom, which he ate. <laughs> and he told the story many times, and the more he told the story, the bigger the mushroom got. <laughs> he was a very good musician, too, if that's I remember right. correctly. That's right. Yeah, played the organ. That's right. John McMillan had an example for any kind of physics problem you could come up with, and was just a first-class nice guy. And I think he brought Ray Gunther on campus. Yes. Uh, when uh, Ray built or, was, or worked on building a cryogenics That's lab. That's right. Ray had a cryogenics lab in the bottom of the engineering building, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Well, he was uh, interest, interested in bringing someone here who could be an experimental physicist and mm -hmm. work in a... Uh, uh, <laughs> I was about to say hot area, but that, <laughs> that would be the opposite of cryogenics. Kind of a cold <laughs> area, but, but uh, Ray Gunther was an excellent addition to the faculty yeah. and brought some, a lot of new ideas and a lot of a, a different approach to things. That was good. I did mention, I think, uh, George Greer. And George Greer is a really nice black man, and I, I'd hate for people to not know about him, but he was a college graduate at the beginning of World War II from Laurel, Mississippi. He went into the Army and he spent his time in the Army teaching mostly young white men from the South how to read and write and how to handle their money when they went to, to town on leave, otherwise they'd be robbed. Went back after the war, walking down the main street of his hometown with his wife when four young white men came walking up the sidewalk toward him and naturally they expected him to get off into the street. And like many black servicemen, his attitude had changed during the war, and he walked right through the middle of them. His wife jumped off the sidewalk, ran home, and when he got home, his family was there, and they bundled him up and got him out of town immediately. Mm. So Omaha's loss was, or Omaha's gain was their loss. Yeah. And he was a great storeroom attendant and just gave lots of good advice. I to remember him quite well. I, I, one thing I remember was that uh, Everybody I knew who uh, had contact with him had the same kind of opinion you yeah. did. They, everyone respected him and, uh, uh, and appreciated his being here. At the He's University. a very nice fellow, and his wife was a teacher, Anna Greer. She substituted for the most part, was a very popular substitute, and we would have parties periodically, and you could tell why she was so popular, because you'd notice the students begin to disappear after a while, and they would inevitably in, be in the kitchen with her, and she'd be telling stories. <laughs> Lovely storyteller, and a very gentle woman. Now, didn't he have a, uh, a relative who was a um, famous uh, singer? That's right. He was re related to Leontine Price, as right. I recall, and she visited Omaha on occasion and visited him. Yeah. Yeah, I, re I remember that about him, too. Uh, uh, gee, there, there, we had uh, lots of great and uh, tremendously interesting people over there. Well, years. there have been so some, some lovely people come through here. Yeah. So now, you must have had uh, a great many students over the years who have uh, who've gone on to, uh, to do things that, uh, well, obviously, you've had lots of pre-med students. Uh, mm -hmm. I imagine uh, there's a good number in the medical community in Omaha. Yes, <laughs> lots, lots, lots of pre-med students uh, and uh, men, many professional chemists. Zoldi Karakash, of course, who recently retired from the waterworks, was a compatriot of mine years mm -hmm. back. Dr. Dennis Eddy is retired from Quaker Oats and now teaches biochemistry at York College. Mm -hmm. Tom Eaton is at the University of Florida. Dick Hall actually was a chemistry major who went bad. He went to grad school in biology, <laughs> became a physiologist, and now he's the director of the program at the University of the Virgin Islands in, in St. Thomas. Mm. Beautiful spot. I was in great, there great spot. Winter. Nice guy to go visit. Yeah. Sandy Knott, of course, and Bob Sink have been employed by the city of Omaha in the wastewater treatment plant. And we've turned out a lot of good people over the years. William Warner Utz was one of our early graduates when I was here, graduate in chemistry who was also killed in Vietnam. Mm. First-class first class student, nice guy, just like uh, many of these kind of uh, strange individuals, you know, who go off in the laboratory and hum to themselves and do lots of, of great work fixing things. And it always kind of annoyed me because I'd be in a class with somebody such as Utz, 
and I could never get the better better of him. You know, he, he <laughs> always was an experiment ahead of me. We've talked about a number of people in your department and in other departments, and just now a few more. Uh, we've talked about students a little bit. I um, wanted to um, to go back there for just a minute, though. Uh, there was a name that you mentioned earlier that I've heard a lot about, but he wasn't here. He'd retired before I got here, and that was uh, Derbyshire. In the uh, yes, Der Derbyshire was an interesting individual. He I don't recall what his specialty was in biology, but he was a scholar in Latin and Greek. Mm -hmm. And at the time I came, he was either retired or just on the edge of retirement. Yeah. And Must I have been retired because mm -hmm. he was retired when I I never knew him. I either. see. He was a good friend of Paul Stageman, and he mm -hmm. used to come and talk with Dr. Stageman on occasion. I believe that he was one of the people that Dr. Bale didn't like very well, so probably didn't get the, the perks that he might have. Yeah, otherwise. I've heard stories uh, completely unsubstantiated, but uh, that that was the reason I had trouble getting rats into the department, because he had some a colony of mice or something. And, uh, well, there was there was actually a problem, I think, some kind of uh, a problem involving a, a murder that had occurred, and I, I honestly believe that Dr. Bale suspected him of doing that oh, murder. Really? <laughs> and I, I think that was the problem between the two of them. Mm. And again, Dr. Bale could do great things, but if he happened to take a dislike to what you're up to, it could be difficult. I, I once heard that there was a faculty committee designed to determine whether we should have intercollegiate athletics or not. And that faculty might have reported something Dr. Bale didn't like. And it's conceivable that the chair of the committee found his desk moved out in the hallway. <laughs> of course, well, Dr. Know. Bale was a very strong supporter of intercollegiate <laughs> athletics. That's, that's right. He wanted to keep it going. Right. But you know, there were, there were times when we had to shift offices around here and there. And, and I would share an office with somebody from the sociology department or somebody from the history department and that was a good thing. You, you get to hear some conversations or learn some things or be challenged on some things that were... Well remember back when you first came here in the uh, student center which was a fairly new building back mm -hmm. then um, there was a faculty lounge and That's a right. faculty uh, uh, cafeteria. That's right there was. And that was a good way to get acquainted with uh, with people from many disciplines. I've made well, many friends that have lasted over the years. We were those. a small enough campus then that you really knew everybody on the faculty. And now, of course, we're so spread out with the South Campus and with people all over. It's it's really difficult to know everybody anymore. Yeah. Well, I've uh, sometimes thought that if I were uh, if I were wealthy, rather than uh, give money to build a building or something, I would. Uh, subsidize the lunch program for faculty so that uh, they'd all go and eat together again. Well, there are probably some of us could use it. I, I recall that when I first came to Omaha University, I was eligible for public housing, but I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> so um, we're just about done here. Uh, mm -hmm. Our time is up, they're telling me. So I uh, want to thank you very much, Dan, for joining us. I've enjoyed this conversation oh. a good deal. and. Uh, I want to thank our audience today for joining us in a visit with Dr. Dan Sullivan, longtime professor of chemistry here at UNO. We've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha as seen through the eyes of the history makers. This is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. Thank you, Jack. Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.